Hello everyone, short notice, this is a video that I recorded for my Patreons only last year, this is a Q&A video, but my Patreons were so kind and allowed me to upload this video here to YouTube so you can also watch and hopefully learn something from these videos, uh, this, these questions. So with that, with further ado, please just watch the video. Hello everyone, this is Jozef Nagy here and approximately two weeks ago I posted a post on Patreon where I asked you to uh, give me some comments with your questions that I can answer in a Q&A video and this is now that Q&A video. So thank you for everyone who posted the questions and now I try to answer them. Okay, so the first question was submitted by Mattia Sammiolo. I hope I pronounced it correctly. So he says, good evening, Jozef. I would like uh, this to be an open discussion, but since the circumstances, it would be interesting to talk about how machines crunch numbers, starting from algebraic frameworks that in FB solutions, how those mat matrix are resolved and how the CPU takes this data and manage it. What do you think? This is an idea, not a commitment. Have a good evening. <laughs> so thank you, Mattia, for your, for your post. It is a very interesting topic. And I mean, what can I say here? So if I just open up here a terminal and just go into the source code of OpenFOAM. So the current one, and if I look for maybe find BCG, there you go. So it's in open form matrices, LDU matrix and solvers. There are all the solvers that are available. And yes, yeah, so if I just go, for example, to into PCG and open up the, the source code, what does it say here? So preconditioned conjugate gradient solver for symmetric LDU matrices using a runtime selectable <laughs> preconditioner. So there are preconditioners and then the solvers. So there is not a lot here, as you can see. There is only the scalar solve and then the solve uh, function. And then in the C file, there is this <laughs> PC, the, the constructor. And then we have the scalar solve function and then we have the solve function, which then reduces to the scalar solve function. So here is really uh, what uh, it uh, does. And it is a very cryptic source code. And um, so it uh, gets in the number of cells. And, um, and then <laughs> the the forest of C++ starts with the matrix and emule uh, the function and then the begin function, set residual field. So it initializes the matrix, then it norms, calculate the normalization factor, um, and then uh, it calculates the initial res residual of your matrix. So this is what you then see also in the output. And... Um, yeah, and then it sets the initial residual also to the final residual, and this will change then with time. And then, so, and if, and then you have this if condition, uh, if the, so uh, the, the tolerance, uh, so th if it's uh, converged, so if we meet the tolerances that we set in FV options, then uh, this, uh, if this is not the case, so we do not, uh, meet these tolerances, then it goes into the algorithm. So the first couple of lines is really just initializing the, the matrix solver and then it really goes into the hard uh, sol solution. And then, yeah, so, yeah, and then it ends and then it, this does it until we either reach a max iter or uh, we f uh, find a, a, a solution. And yeah, and then um, 
it just returns the solver performance. Okay, and then whatever happens then in between in this if uh, statement, yes, so it uh, selects the preconditioner and then, uh, and then it really does the conjugate gradient um, algorithm. So uh, explaining here everything would not, I couldn't do it in 10 minutes, in a 10 minutes part to answer this video. So what I would um, advise you is to to go through the source code so here uh, here it is um, so here uh, is for example the update solution and residuals so here is the for loop over all the cells yeah so it is a high level implementation of the pcg and then it goes into um, into sub uh, functions and then does the work there. So there are uh, quite some uh, solvers available in OpenFOAM. So if you're interested, just take a look at the differences here in these solvers. Then of course you have the preconditioners and then also the, the smoother. So you can take a look at that. I mean, there is this doc file we can take a look at the doc files here, so uh, not a lot in this file, for example. And then in the next one, there's also not a lot of description here. So it is, uh, this is, it is a very, um, how the rubber meets the road situation, where it is implemented on a high level, uh, uh, and then it goes into sub uh, functions that are, uh, uh, that go further down in the source code. So I would advise you to take a look at the source code if you really want to, uh, to learn how this works. Or alternatively, I also have a couple of links for you. And I hope that I will not forget to put this then in the description box uh, below this video. So if I just copy these here and paste it, here you have a very good description of linear solvers and preconditioners. So I myself, as, as a as a um, programmer or a code developer have never really changed or modified anything in these preconditioners or solvers. I just use them. I work more on the physics side and, uh, and possibly also on the meshing side, but uh, I, uh, for the matrix solvers, I usually use them as they come. So here, uh, this, uh, th these, uh, PD uh, this set of PDF is not coming from me, so the, the Credit goes all to the, the authors of these, um, of these linear solvers, but here you f find a good description of how this really works with the ma matrix structures and how the addressing works and how the LDU matrix, which we saw also here. So th this really belongs to the source code. So just uh, take a look at uh, this PDF, this is very, very helpful in this regard. It is, you have um, how many, s 77 slides on this. So this is already a very good introduction. Then there is another PDF that you can use. And I, again, will hopefully post this into the description below. So it also crash course into the FV uh, a finite, finite volume method, how this is being uh, being solved, but this is uh, more on the script schemes, not so much on the FV solution part, but this is also something that could be interested, interesting for you. So again, uh, and, and here now you have the linear solver. So here uh, they also touch on the linear solvers and how they work. Multigrid solvers. So this is also a PDF that uh, you can take a look at if you're interested in this. Then another PDF from the Chalmers course and they also talk about the linear solvers here. So the idea is to linearize the nonlinear equations and then put them in a matrix formulation and then solve them as a linear 
matrix equations. This is also a possibility. And then the very last thing that came also to my mind, and I'm I'm, I'm on, going to be honest, I'm not the best expert in this, in this field, so I may maybe redirect you to these four uh, PDFs where people have, who have more experience with, the, with this question can help you maybe more. So here you can also find some uh, topics on these, uh, the conjugate gradient approach and so on. Okay, so here are these four PDFs. I would advise you to take a look at them and then you can possibly learn how this works. And also just going through the source code, it is in SRC OpenFOAM and then matrices. There you have all the subroutines and methods that are currently implemented. So I hope this helps you. And uh, yeah, so I'm happy to start a discussion if you are interested also in the comments below. So yeah, this is what I can advise you now in this Q&A video. Okay, so the second question comes from Louis Pasnik. I hope this is how you pronounce your name. So, hey, Jozef, any instructions to successfully compile CF mesh on later versions of OpenFOAM would be helpful. I tried to install for OpenFOAM 9, but I get a lot of opt OpenFOAM not found errors. Some instructions I find online to edit source code are a bit confusing to me as a light Linux user. So you don't have to be li a light Linux, lo light Linux user to, in order to get uh, to have some problems with compiling CF mesh uh, under uh, um, OpenFOAM 9. So I have here OpenFOAM 9 so I can source it for you. Open from 9 etc bash. So if I now dun 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 okay simple form. Okay, so then the the next step would be just to uh, go to CF mesh um, download. Um, where is so here is the source forge. So, so just download, not this, I don't want to download the Windows version, I want to download the source code. So uh, as far as I know, in openform.com you have the version 1.1.1, uh, but there seems to be a 1.1.2 also available that you can download. So let's just try and download this and then I will try to compile and then comment on the compilation procedure there. Okay, so it's 18 megabytes, not very huge. And okay, I already downloaded it previously. So let me just copy it here. Users, downloads, and then CF mesh. Um, okay, and then let's just Extract it, no, tar, extract it. Okay, so and now if I go to CF mesh and I take a look at the readme file, what does it take, uh, say here? So um, CF mesh is tested on Linux and MS Windows. So installation binaries and source code can be downloaded from there. So not a lot of information on the installation here. And um, yeah, so not a lot of information here. So all we can do is here execute all w make and then hope that it works. So again, I'm sim <laughs> simple foam. It's uh, still version nine as uh, we wanted. So I just execute all w clean just to make sure and then all w make and then let's see what happens okay so it compiles i may now speed this up a little bit until we get some results
Okay, so that was it. <laughs> yeah, so you see here a uh, recipe for target failed and so on. So if I go to the very first error message here, which was, I believe, not here. Okay, then it was a bit further down. Yeah, so here it is. Uh, so um, this uh, is file is not declared in this scope. So check. Ma so it, it, it tries to compile a function which checks uh, for a certain dictionary. So most probably mesh ticked, and it asks for the fu function is file, and this does not work in OpenFOAM 9. So the, the reason for that is because unfortunately. OpenFOAM.com version and OpenFOAM.org version diverged in the last couple of week, uh, years and some of the functions are not available anymore. And this is why you get these error messages. So you have now two uh, possibilities. One is that you manually port CF mesh to OpenFOAM 9, which is a lot of work. Or a lot easier is it if you just use version 2106 for CF mesh. And so, so it is a lot of work to port uh, the source code because you have to make uh, 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 changes in the source code. Look in uh, version 9, what are the new versions uh, of those functions that worked previously and don't work now, and then replace it in the source code of CF mesh in order for it to compile. That is a lot of work. A lot easier is if you do what I do here, and this is also what I would do here. I would set up aliases in my bash RC. So uh, these kind of aliases for my different versions of OpenFOAM. And then whenever I want to run CF mesh, I just type in version 2106. Then I can just run CF mesh. And then when I start, want to start this, to run the simulation, I just type in V9 and then I load version 9 and then I can utilize the models of version 9. And previously I can utilize CF mesh in version 2106. So you can easily change between versions here. So this is what I would advise you to do, not to try to port CF mesh to version 9 because that's a lot of work but rather use whatever is already available and then use version uh, 2106 to use, then run CF mesh, and then immediately once you have your polymesh folder and your files, switch over to version 9 and then, and then just run your simulation. So what would this, would this look like? So version 2106. And now this loads all the, the models that are available in the openform.com version. <sighs> this takes a while. Okay, so now I can uh, just type in Cartesian mesh. So of course I get the error message, but I don't have an, any uh, case setup here. But now I, we could run in 2106 Cartesian mesh, for example. And then immediately when I have my uh, polymesh folder, I just type in V9. It's a version 9. And then I can run whatever solver you want to utilize here. So I don't know, Interfoam. And then of course, also here I get the error message, but now I can use Interfoam in version nine. So he, he, this way uh, you can use both version nine and CF mesh, but you don't have to port the source code because it's just a lot of work to port uh, the source code for, to version nine because there are a lot of uh, syntax differences. Most functions uh, do the same, but they change the name. Um, yeah, for whatever reason, I don't want to comment on that. So this is the, the easiest um, way to use version 9 and CF mesh. I hope this helps. Okay, so the next question was also posted by Louis uh, Pasnik. Um, Hello, Jozef. I would like to explore the use of strategically located thin plate baffles inside complex ductwork, internal to STL geometry to study flow distribution. It would be great to know if it is possible to create zero thickness, no slip baffles within the mesh and to know how to mesh it and set patches to it. Further, if there is a way to do this, but uh, as a porous media, 
that will perforate the plate, it would definitely be worth a Patreon subscription upgrade. LOL. Yeah, so uh, Louis or Louis, I'm not sure. Mm, you, uh, this is possible. In fact, I already did an uh, um, industrial project on that. So it did work. The, the idea is, so let me just draw you here a quick uh, sketch in MS Paint. Um, okay, so uh, I, I don't know your um, um, problem setting, but if I assume, make some assumptions. So this is a wall of your STL and another wall in your STL, and then we have here an inlet flow going in, and that then in that internal geometry you have some kind of uh, baffles, so thin plates which then guide the flow uh, in a certain direction, so possibly away from a part of the geometry which shouldn't be touched by uh, the flow, so it, uh, the flow is then redirected in a certain direction uh, and then it exits the flow. So, so something like that, I, I don't know the, 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 uh, uh, the, the exact geometry of course, but uh, the question is can you do his th your theme plates? Yes, you can and they will then be marked as walls and they work also as, or as, uh, as walls, but of course what you can also do is just replace this with uh, a region which is a porous medium and then you can uh, set the Darcy coefficient so that this porous medium uh, approach is also redirecting your flow uh, in exactly the same manner as your perforated plane plates would be. Now for that However, you have to know the Darcy coefficients. So if you already know the Darcy coefficients of your perforated plate region, then you don't have to do the thin plate simulations. Then you can just set, a, just select a cell zone here in this region and then define it uh, in FV options to be a porous medium. And then all you have to do is just define the Darcy coefficients and also the directions of your lo local coordinate system and you have already won. So this is a very simple um, possibility. Uh, uh, if you don't have the Darcy coefficients, what you can do, you can uh, simulate the, uh, the thin plate uh, flow and then uh, with different volume fluxes and then you can uh, make a curve of the pressure drop over your thin plates as a function of your volume flux. Uh, or the velocity as, as it is. So if, because if you take a look at the Darcy Forheim uh, Wikipedia page, Darcy's law, let's check out, um, let, let, let's, uh, let, let's check out something in, in English and then see what is the best description of this model is this better yes yeah, so I, I think this is the best here okay so this is the equation that you solve or this one so your pressure drop is proportional to uh, the viscous term so the viscosity then your Darcy coefficients and your velocity and then your Forheimer term the for the Forheimer uh, equations and this is uh, velocity squared and then your density so usually uh, usually for such problems you neglect the second term and you only work with the Darcy term uh, so and, and uh, this is what I mean that you can then in your thin plate simulations you can calculate the pressure drop uh, with the full Navier-Stokes equations and you know the volume flux so and you know the viscosity of your flow and then with the, pr the pressure drop and your velocity uh, your mean velocity your mean uh, velocity here at the inlet of your thin plates you can extract that and then you, you can calculate your Darcy coefficient and uh, this is something that can help you a lot 
so and with that you can set up your Darcy coefficient in um, uh, that defines the pressure drop and uh, so defines your pressure drop over your uh, over your porous medium and then the direction uh, of your local coordinate system will then define the, the direction of the flow. So the, I, I believe here you have, yes, yeah, so here you have your uh, FE option constant. So for the Forheimer part will be 0, 0, 0, or uh, I believe minus, minus 1000 is what you're supposed to set if you want to switch it off. And then for the Darcy coefficients, then you use in one direction the calculated Darcy Forheimer uh, equations and then switch off the other two directions. And then here in your coordinate system, you can choose the local direction which the you want to have in your porous medium. So, we, so either you already have your Darcy coefficients and then it is just a very simple porous medium problem or you run your perforate, uh, so your thin plate simulations with a couple of velocity values, you have your pressure drop, you have your, your mean velocity, and then you can calculate a Darcy coefficient out of that. Yeah, as, and then go into your, uh, uh, your porous medium problem from that point on. Yeah, so that's it. So if you can do this yourself, then <laughs> um, then sh sure, just go ahead and then do these simulations. If you need some support on the highest tier, I am happy to support you uh, in your simulation project. So I hope this helps. And the last question was um, submitted by Tibor Such. I'd like to ask you about CHT multi-region foam solver, especially the compressible turbulent temperature coupled baffled Bix boundary condition, which seemed to be the go-to method to model heat transfer between solids and fluid. How does it work and how to set it up properly? Okay, so yes, this is the go-to problem if you are, don't have radiation, because then there is the sister boundary condition, turbulent temperature, rod baffle mix, I think, uh, and that is for radiation. But uh, if you don't have radiation, this is the go-to boundary condition to model the, the heat transfer between a fluid and the, the solid. So this is correct. How, to se how does it work and how to set it up? Okay. So for that, we can take a look at the source code. And... Let's just go here into the source code. So the source code is in SRC turbulence models, compressible turbulent fluid mo thermal models, derived FD patch fields, and then turbulent temperature coupled baffled mix. In the folder above, there is this sister boundary condition, turbulent temperature rod coupled mix for radiative, uh, um, for radiative problems. But let's just take a look at um, the problem at hand here. Okay, so if I open up the header file, then there is a rather good description of this boundary condition. So it says mixed boundary condition for temperature to be used for heat transfer on back-to-back -back baffles. This means solid and fluid. Optional thin layer uh, resistance can be speci specified uh, through thi uh, th uh, thickness layers and couple layers. And then so how does it work? And this is now uh, how, how it works. So you calculate the gradient, so both on the fluid and the solid. So you calculate the gradient and you calculate the, the value on those boundaries and then you, um, you mix the, the boundary conditions. So you have both a fixed value boundary condition and a, gra a fixed gradient boundary condition and the mixture factor. And so you assume uh, to it to be zero gradient in this boundary condition and you assume that the fixed value part is the neighbor. So if you're in the fluid, the solid temperature, if you're in the solid, then the fluid temperature. And then you have a, mix, uh, a mixture fraction. So it, it's be between zero and one. So if it's 0 0.25 for uh, the ref gradient, then it's 0 0.75 for the, for the uh, fixed value. And so, so it... Um, um, it, it, uh, it interpolates between the two, um, so the, it scales the two uh, contributions. 
and the k delta is the heat transfer coefficient from the fluid to solid and solid to, to fluid multiplied by the delta coefficients which is not nothing else than one divided by the 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 the, the, the distance between the phase center and the cell center and then the thermal conductivity is uh, uh, is kappa and can be derived in different uh, ways. Uh, usually, it is taken out of the fluid uh, kappa, so the thermodynamic properties or the solid thermodynamic properties. Okay, so then here is a typical boundary condition how you would set it up. There are a couple of optional entries um, and a couple of um, required entries. So. This uh, the the neighbor the name of the neighboring uh, uh, temperature uh, field is usually T unless you have a special uh, solver where your temperature is not T then you you can enter a, a, a custom name for your temperature field usually it's just T so this is a no brainer and then you can add <laughs> thin layers so if you are you have I don't know um, uh, a window. Uh, and uh, you have uh, glass, very thin glass, then a very thin air layer and a very thin glass layer. Then you can define the thickness of those layers, glass thickness, uh, then the air thickness in between, and then the glass thickness. And you assume the air to be also solid, so you don't care about the flow between the two glass uh, plates. And then you can add the, uh, heat co uh, the thermal conductivity of those individual layers. Some cases this makes sense, some cases you can just forget about them, then you just don't use them. Then the kappa <coughs> sorry, the kappa method is usually fluid or solid thermal. Oh, okay, here it's look up, but we will take a look at an actual boundary condition and then you will see. And then the, the name of the kappa field uh, is, uh, if you look up, then you specify it. If it's the solid thermal, then forget about this entry here. And then the value is an initial value. This will be overwritten during calculation. And it needs to have a mapped wall FV patch. And we will take a look at that also. OK, so that's it. Then in the C file, you have a lot of constructors. So yeah, so a lot of constructors here. And then in the update coefficient function is where you solve the boundary con all the boundary conditions. And yeah, what do you have here? So this is what I mentioned, my K delta. So this is either on the fluid, my K delta. This is this kappa, the thermal conductivity, divided by this characteristic, characteristic length. So uh, delta QFs is 1 divided by this characteristic length. And then mm, uh, same world. And then you uh, solve the equation. So usually you, mm, where is it? I skipped it. Mm. Where is it? Ah, here it is. Okay. So up until this point, you just set up the internal fields, so the fluid field and the solid field, and then uh, so the gradient is zero. Then the neighbor field, so if you're in the fluid, then the solid is your reference value, and then your mixture fracture uh, fraction, and then this is your neighbor. So if you're in the fluid, then the solid uh, thermal uh, conductivity divided by your a neighbor delta, so this characteristic length and your characteristic length. And here it is how it is implemented, it is uh, described. Both sides agree on the temperature and the gradient. So uh, on the fluid and the solid side, the, the, the value should be the same and also the gradient should be the same. And we've got the degree of freedom, how to implement this, and then the two reasonable choices, and they go for the second option. So you use zero gradient, you assume a zero gradient, uh, and then the neighbor value is your uh, boundary, and then you have a, a mixing value. And yeah, and then um, this is actually what you do. So um, the, this mixture fraction, and this is then calling up uh, the mixed FV patch field 
boundary condition, uh, which then uh, calculates, uh, maybe I can just quickly pull this up. No, no, my documents. SRC finite volume FE patch finite okay fields FV patch fields derived and then the mixed no the not derived okay let's just see where is the mixed boundary condition mixed here in basics okay basic and then mixed and then let's quickly check where this is actually so yeah so here this this base boundary condition then uh, starts with the reference value the gradient and the value fraction this is what you calculate actually in that special boundary condition and then in the evaluate yes here you have so in the evaluate boundary condition then what you have is your your value flag fraction which is this value here multiplied your reference value which is your neighbor value and then one minus your value fraction plus your reference gradient okay so this is what so it, it calls in this line it calls the update of this um, of this mixed uh, boundary condition and it uses these values to calculate the the fields so it is not a very fancy boundary condition. Here at the beginning, you, s you initialize the neighbor fields and the b and my fields and the k uh, the, the the kappa fields uh, and so on. So it really assumes a zero gradient boundary condition and that your uh, reference value is coming from the neighbor. So this is what this boundary condition actually does. I know of people who improved this. Um, but th this is the, the current implementation, how it is being used. And then we have a tutorial here in the, tut uh, no, I have to change directory. So in heat transfer, uh, CHT multi-region from and snappy multi-region heater. So let's just make a copy of that and then possibly run it in serial and uh, I just I don't want to run the simulation I just want to run it run the case setup uh, I'm still on version 9 sorry when I load 2106 and then um, Let's just see all the pre-processing steps and then what this boundary condition looks like. Yes, so if I now go into zero and mm, did it run all the cases? Please to already run. Okay. Ah, okay. I really should run all come on all clean first and then all run again okay so now I hope that this was yes now we have in zero the correct uh, initial conditions now if I go for example to top air and I take a look at the temperature boundary condition now we have here a typical boundary condition set up now uh, this is all, uh, top air to right solid so this is really the the boundary between the fluid top air to right solid then you use the name of this boundary condition then you initialize it your neighbor field is t because it's called t in uh, the, uh, the, uh, the default uh, conjugate heat transfer solver and the kappa is taken from the thermodynamic properties of your fluid so not, not nothing fancy, you just need these four uh, entries. You can, of course, uh, define... Uh, okay, I, I don't have it here again, oh, so let me just go back. Okay, so I'm already here, very good. So you can, in addition to that, uh, add 
these uh, very thin layers if you want. If you don't want, then you just use these four lines here. So then if I know that's a nano and then right solid. So in the solid, we have a very similar boundary condition. So this is now right solid to top air. This is the corresponding boundary condition to what I showed you previously. It is the same boundary condition. The only difference is that now, since you are in the solid, the, the kappa value, so the thermal conductivity, is taken out of the solid thermodynamics properties. So this is really it. And then one last thing that I mentioned, and uh, here at the very beginning that I want to point out, is um, bum 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 where is it example yes here that it needs to be a mapped wall fv patch now what does this mean so here in our or or run script we run block mesh surface feature and then snappy hex mesh but then uh, and in snappy hex mesh we use this approach of multiple locations in mesh. So our STL files are divided up in a way that uh, they form individual zones, then, so they are closed. And then in each individual STL file, we place a location in mesh. And then a snappy hex mesh will mesh for all the, uh, for all the STL files and not select just one, and then throw out the mesh for everything else. It will uh, mesh uh, for all the STL files and then put them into cell zones. And then with the command uh, split mesh regions minus cell zones and overwrite, it will split the individual meshes in those STL files or in the cell zones into sub meshes. And these sub meshes are then in constant. So, for example, constant stop air, you have a polymesh. And co conjugate heat transfer solver will only solve so, uh, the problems on those sub meshes. So, this constant and uh, poly mesh folder will be completely ignored uh, for the simulations. And this split mesh region commands, so while splitting your initial snappy hex mesh, then creates automatically. So, if I go to top air poly mesh boundary, it will uh, take the original boundaries that you generated with block mesh and snappy hex mesh, but while splitting uh, the cell zones into the sub meshes, it will introduce your boundary uh, your boundaries between your solid and fluid, and these are then these mapped walls. So you don't have to worry about the mapped wall, you just have to set up your snappy hex mesh correctly, and then split your mesh. And then I can just show you the log file of split mesh regions, so it splits up into five regions and the, the regions are called accordingly. You define these in snappy hex mesh as I showed you. Where is the snap here? The snappy hex mesh dictionary. So here uh, with your location in mesh, you already define the name of your, of your fluids and solids. And then it's loaded incorrectly. And then, um, yeah, and then here, adding patches, this is what I meant. While splitting, it has to introduce new boundaries and it adds these mapped walls, bottom air to right solid, but um, where is top air? So yeah, top air to right solid. So this is, this is what, uh, right solid to top air and top air to right solid, so it introduces these uh, mapped walls where then you can utilize this boundary condition. So this is really how it works. So the boundary condition itself is not very difficult. Uh, a bit of a challenge is setting up the mesh correctly. So you have to already think during the ge geometry stage that you have to specialize your STL files so your subregions are closed off so that you can use this number, uh, this location in mesh approach where you define multiple locations in mesh. So you have cell zones already defined during cell snappy hex mesh, so you can execute split mesh regions, which then create your sub meshes for your, all your solids and all your fluids. And everything else, so, and then the, these map walls will be set up automatically for you. The only thing is think about how you 
define your STL files and I would advise you to just take a look at this tutorial here and then what does the, the STL file look like and then prepare it accordingly. Okay, so I hope this helps. Okay, so that was it. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for everyone who took their time to uh, submit some questions for this Q&A video. I hope that I could help you at least with some of your questions or at least I could guide you to other resources which can help you. So with that, I would like to thank you for watching and listening and I hope to see you next time.